This is a revision video for the A-level chemistry topic of thermodynamics and we're particularly looking at some of the key definitions that you need to understand in order to be able to construct Born Harbor cycles. Thermodynamics is the science of heat and other forms of energy. Often within thermodynamics we'll be discussing enthalpy changes, which are changes to heat energy happening at constant pressure. Often these will be standard enthalpies and this basically means that we have to have standard conditions. So we're usually either making one mole of a substance or using up one mole of a substance. It needs to be a constant pressure and if we don't state what the pressure is we tend to assume it's 100 kilopascals and it needs to be at a stated temperature. And again if this isn't explicitly given we assume room temperature so we assume 298 Kelvin. In year 12, when you were first introduced to Hess's law, you met the standard enthalpies of formation and combustion. So we're going to look at these first because they're familiar. You should know that the standard enthalpy of formation is the enthalpy change or heat energy at constant pressure change when one mole of a compound is made out of its constituent elements under standard conditions, so 100 kilopascals and 298 Kelvin, with all reactants and products being in their standard states. We can represent this with a chemical symbol equation like this. So key things to note are that we are making one mole of water and that the water is a liquid, whereas the oxygen and hydrogen are gases. You may have a revision guide or textbook which uses delta FH rather than delta HF for the standard enthalpy of formation. If you do, this is absolutely fine. They both represent the same thing. As a personal preference, these enthalpy changes are delta H changes. So I've always preferred to put the little letter afterwards. Based on this standard enthalpy of formation, can you now write a chemical equation which represents the standard enthalpy of formation for carbon dioxide, methane and ammonia? Pause the video and then check your work. Hopefully you managed to write down the following three equations. The first two aren't particularly tricky, although hopefully you remembered that carbon was going to be a solid at room temperature. The trick with the third one is to remember that this is a standard enthalpy of formation. So we need to be making one mole of ammonia and therefore we need half a mole of nitrogen and three halves of a mole of hydrogen. It wouldn't be appropriate for us to have one mole of nitrogen reacting with three moles of hydrogen to make two moles of ammonia. Also, it wouldn't be appropriate for us to use a reversible reaction arrow, even though we're really used to doing that when describing the harbour process, because we're not interested in the chemical reaction as a whole, we're just interested in the formation of ammonia. The second enthalpy change that you met in year 12 was the standard enthalpy of combustion. So remember, this is the enthalpy change when one mole of a substance is completely burned in oxygen. So that means it's going to be fully oxidised, with all reactants and products being in their standard states. Here's an example equation for methane. Note that we have one mole of methane and that we're making carbon dioxide, not carbon monoxide. Based on this, can you write an equation representing the standard enthalpy of combustion for hydrogen, ethane and propanol? Pause the video, write down your answers and then check your work. Again, there's nothing particularly tricky here and you have been doing these since year 12. The one thing to watch out for is that if you're used to doubling up your equations to remove halves, we can't do this here because it's a standard enthalpy of combustion, so we must be burning one mole. Now, they weren't involved in Hess's cycles, but you did meet the first ionisation energy in year 12 when you learnt about mass spectrometry. So you know that this is the standard enthalpy change when a mole of gaseous atoms loses an electron each to form a mole of gaseous ions. And you're used to writing equations that look like these. Remember, it doesn't matter what type of ion an atom would usually make in a chemical reaction. That's not what's happening here. The first ionisation energy is just about the energy change when one electron is taken away from any atom. Pause the video and write down an equation for the first ionisation energy of each of these three elements. Hopefully this isn't too challenging for you since it's just year 12 revision. So for each example, we start off with a gaseous atom and we're left with a gaseous ion and an electron. And it's going to look exactly the same for all three elements. After the first ionisation energy come the second and third and fourth and however many there are. So in each instance, we're just removing one electron and increasing the charge by one. So if we look at the second ionisation energy of iron, we go from Fe plus to Fe2 plus with a loss of an electron. And if we think about the fifth ionisation energy of vanadium, we go from V4 plus to V5 plus. The important thing is that we're only ever removing one electron. 
it wouldn't be correct to have the fifth ionization energy of vanadium being a vanadium atom losing five electrons. That's just not what we're doing here. We're always taking one electron away. Pause the video and write yourself an equation that represents each of these ionization energies. So for each one of these, the number of the ionization energy should be the same as the charge on the ion that you finish with. So for the second ionization energy of chromium, we finish with Cr2+. For the third ionization energy of cobalt, we finish with cobalt 3 plus, And for the fourth ionization energy of lead, we finish with Pb4+. Plus. The first new enthalpy change that you meet for year 13 is electron affinity. And I like to think of this as the opposite of ionization energy. So ionization energy involves taking electrons away and electron affinity involves adding them on. We're talking about a mole of gaseous atoms being converted into a mole of gaseous ions when they gain a mole of electrons. So when we write an equation for this, it's always atoms on the left hand side. We're not thinking about molecules. But other than that, it's fairly straightforward. For the first electron affinity, we're adding an electron and we're getting an ion with a negative charge. So pause the video and write down an equation that represents each of these electron affinities. So we add one electron to one chlorine atom to get one chloride ion, and we do exactly the same for bromide, and we do exactly the same for phosphorus. Just like with ionization energies, we don't just have one electron affinity. We can have subsequent ones if an atom is able to receive more than one electron. One thing that you probably should be aware of is that although the first electron affinity of a non-metal is going to be exothermic, the second or third will be endothermic because we're adding an electron onto something that's already negatively charged. So we can represent the second electron affinity of oxygen like this. Again, it's the second electron affinity, so we're finishing with a two minus charge, and it's only that second electron that's being added. It's not the first one as well. So pause the video and write down equations for these electron affinities. So for the second electron affinity of sulfur, we're going to finish with a sulfide ion with a two minus charge because it's the second electron affinity. And likewise for phosphorus, we're going to finish with P two minus because it's gained two electrons. And for the third electron affinity of nitrogen, we're going to gain just that third electron to leave us with N three minus. Our second new enthalpy for year 13 is going to be the standard enthalpy of atomization. And this is the enthalpy change when we make one mole of gaseous atoms from an element in its standard state. Here are two different examples of how this can happen. When we're thinking about a metal, all we're going to be looking at is a state change from one mole of solid atoms to one mole of gaseous atoms. If we've got a molecular substance, then that molecule is going to need to break apart. And this is where people start to get a little bit confused. You have to remember that the standard enthalpy of atomization involves making one mole of gaseous atoms. It doesn't matter how many moles of molecules we have to start with. So here, because a sulfur molecule has eight atoms in it, to make one mole of sulfur atoms, I only need an eighth of a mole of sulfur molecules. So you really need to be aware of that. Pause the video here and try to write down an equation for the standard enthalpy of atomization for chlorine, bromine and phosphorus. So there are two things to watch for here. One is the standard states at the start and being a gas at the end, and the other is making sure that we're always making one mole of atoms. So in this first example, we have half a mole of chlorine molecules. In our second example, we have half a mole of bromine molecules, but of course these are a liquid to begin with and a gas at the end. And then for phosphorus, we need a quarter of a mole of solid phosphorus turning into phosphorus gas. Our next two standard enthalpies are two that people often get confused, hydration and solution. So the enthalpy change of hydration is when water molecules surround one mole of gaseous ions, which really doesn't sound like something is going to actually happen in real life, but there you go. So for this, we just need an ion and then we use AQ for water because this isn't water that's taking part in a chemical reaction, it's just making the ion aqueous. And so these are really straightforward equations. So have a quick practice and see if you can write one for the hydration of chlorine, zinc and magnesium. 
for each one of these equations, you need to pick the appropriate ion for that element. So here we have chlorine, so we have a chloride ion, and therefore it's got a single minus charge. And as you see, we just write plus AQ. We don't need to write H2O because it's not taking part in the chemical reaction. And we're left with aqueous chloride ions. Then for zinc, we need a two plus charge on that zinc ion. And again, we use the AQ for the fact that it's becoming aqueous and likewise for magnesium. Now, the enthalpy of solution is different to the enthalpy of hydration. So hydration is this weird thing where we've got gaseous ions hanging around, whereas solution is just we've got an ionic compound and we're just going to dissolve it in some water. So this is the enthalpy change when one mole of a solute dissolves completely in enough water that the ions are no longer interacting with each other. So for each one of these equations, we're just going to have one mole of the ionic solid on the left hand side, and then it's going to split apart into the ions that make it up. Pause the video and have a go at writing standard enthalpies of solution for these three compounds. So sodium nitrate is going to split apart into sodium ions and nitrate ions. Potassium carbonate will split apart into potassium ions and carbonate ions and iron bromide will of course split apart into iron ions and bromide ions. So really the only challenging thing here is making sure that you've got the correct formula for each one of those compounds. Finally, in this series, we have lattice enthalpies of formation and dissociation, and these are inverse processes of each other. So just like how if you did a bond enthalpy calculation, you know that the amount of energy that is absorbed to break a bond is the same as the amount of energy that is released when that bond is made. Here we have the same idea. The exothermic process of lattice formation is going to be the direct inverse of the endothermic process of dissociation. And so the two um, enthalpy values will be the same magnitude, but with different signs. So lattice formation is the standard enthalpy change when one mole of solid ionic compound is formed from its gaseous ions. And this is often what we're trying to work out when we do born harbour cycles, which we'll cover in the next video. So if I wanted to write an equation, I could have some magnesium ions and some chloride ions joining together to make one mole of ionic solid. Based on this, can you write an equation that represents the lattice enthalpy of formation of these three ionic solids? Hopefully that was relatively straightforward for you as well. Make sure that you have got your state symbols in there. It's really important that we have gaseous ions turning into a solid ionic compound. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you found that a useful introduction to some of the terminology that we're going to be using in this thermodynamics topic. Your next step is to move on to Born Harbour Cycles and how we can use all of these various standard enthalpies to do calculations and make predictions about the stability of compounds.